Good morning. Good morning. We welcome you all to our service today. This is the fourth Sunday in the Easter season. It has several different names to it. I've been telling you the different Latin names that have the background of what these services during Lent and Easter are. Um, today is a long name. It's called Misericordia Domini. And I'm sure you can all say that, right? Say that after me. Misericordia Domini. <laughs> it's your Latin background for all of you who had that in high school, which is probably a, just a few, maybe. Uh, cordia has to do with the heart. Maybe we have some English words that tie in with that. Um, miser has to do with sympathy, um, mercy in particular. When you put those two together, though, there, it's a descriptive way. It's saying the merciful heart. Uh, and it speaks of the goodness or the kindness of the Lord. It comes from one of the Psalms, Misericordia Domini. You actually also hear it in the uh, 23rd Psalm which you'll hear today too, when it talks about the goodness of the shepherd. So this is the goodness of the Lord, particularly regarding his resurrection and all the blessings that come to us after that. And then traditionally, and this goes way back in church history also, one of the Sundays following Easter, and it's not always the same in the different traditions of worship that there are, but there's always one Sunday usually in the Easter season, that is called Good Shepherd Sunday. And that is what today is. And so the idea of misericordia domini and Good Shepherd go hand in hand. The goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the shepherd as he guides us through this life, now is our risen Savior. So those are the, those are the thoughts for the Sunday. We also have Mother's Day today. And we're coming before our Lord thankful for the mothers that he has given us to guide us on our way. Those will be some of the thoughts that are there. Now, I mentioned earlier that Jane is not with us today, so it gives me a little bit of an opportunity, I thought, to take and to guide you through some things that are in the hymnal that you might not have been able to see so far. So if you would, take out your hymnals, the blue hymnal, and if you would turn, first of all, to page 235. I think this is one of the very interesting features that they put into this hymn, though. Um, 235. And at the top it says daily devotions. Yeah. These daily devotions are designed actually for the family use, to be used at home, or in a small gathering, perhaps that's at church or whatever it is, a retreat, something along those lines, but especially with the idea of families behind it. This is something that you could utilize at home in your worship at home. Now, you can read this at some other time here, what they explain in regards to it. If you would just turn with me to the next couple pages. Some of this you are familiar with in a little bit of a different form. We have worship services for the morning that we've always utilized here at least once in the month called the matin service or the morning praise service. I believe now it's called the morning prayer. It's always had names going back and forth like that. Um, and in the pages following this, we have several other uh, uh, forms of service too. Let me explain what the matins and vespers. You know what matins and vespers are. Vespers is the evening service that we normally use if we have an evening service at times. These come from way back in time, beginning in the 300s, believe it or not, uh, AD, following Christ's uh, resurrection and ascension, but really became, I would call it codified, it collected together around the 600s and the 700s. And they actually were set up as periods of worship within the church. A lot of times these were used in the monasteries later on, but it actually what began in the normal congregational settings. And they followed the idea that the Jews had of hours of prayer. The Jewish of the Old Testament times, New Testament times, they had three hours of prayer that they utilized during the day. They were uh, at nine o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock at noon, and then 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And those were their times of prayers. That involved uh, temple worship, it involved the synagogue, it involved the homes also at times. 
Well, in the Christian times, these services were in some measure patterned after that idea, all right? And they followed uh, the eight different time periods of the day, okay? Beginning at 12 o'clock midnight, three o'clock, these are rough times. I mean, they did not have clocks like we have clocks that they followed specifically that, that period. But around 12 o'clock at night, three o'clock in the morning, six o'clock, nine o'clock, 12 noon, three, six, nine. I think if you count those up, they're eight, right? Okay, so every three hours. And they were given names that you are somewhat, at least a couple of them you're familiar with, matins. You know what the matin service is. You who have worshiped with us before, we utilize that once a month. It's a, a, a morning praise service is basically what it does. The idea was at the start of the day, the difference between us using it and them using it back then is we probably use it at what, nine o'clock in the morning? You know when they utilized it? I can see you all doing this too. Midnight, midnight. yeah. Somewhere around midnight was actually the matins time. And the, uh, the idea was, well, the day in one sense is beginning, although everyone is sleeping, right? Um, but it would be a time of praise. That was the idea uh, behind the matin service. So you can see that on page 236. I cannot say that this is the way that it was formulated years ago. Uh, some of the different songs that are utilized or psalms are what were used in the past. But again, this is a shortened form that the families could use or a, a congregational meeting or whatever it might be. Although I don't think they'll be meeting at midnight so often. Uh, so matins for us becomes kind of the morning praise service. And that was the idea, praise. The emphasis was upon the word of God, the word of God, and in praise to him. Okay, our next service, let's see. I'm forgetting which ones they have in here. They have listed as dawn on page 238. This is actually the one we will utilize today. Normally, this would be more like 3 o'clock in the morning in, uh, in history. Is. Louds is, uh, perhaps you can catch the meaning behind that. Uh, I think we utilize that term at times in different ways. Loud, louds is simply the Latin word for praise. So again, as you really begin the day, I suppose, this idea of praise before the Lord uh, takes place. Um, it was... Utilized at dawn, so don't think of it as strictly at 3 o'clock. Um, I don't know, when is dawn striking us nowadays? 6 o'clock, maybe? Yeah. So, or just a little bit before dawn. Think of the women going to the tomb, hurrying to the tomb um, very early in the morning uh, as the sun is just beginning to rise, it says. That, that was kind of the idea of lauds at dawn. When, when nature is waking up, Again, it's a service of praise. Um, praise to the Lord for the day that lies ahead and the blessings that he will give. Our next one. Start of work, it says, called Prime. This would be 6 o'clock in the morning, right? Beginning of work. Nature has awakened people or rubbing the sleep from their eyes, getting on their way to work. But as they begin, they begin with the time of prayer. That was the emphasis for this. The whole day lies ahead. We have to come before God asking him for the grace and the blessings and the strength that we need as we approach the day and the opportunities that are there. And that was the idea, start at work. You begin that with a word of praise and prayer before the Lord. The next one is not really included here. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. Terse. Midday. Yeah, they call it midday, but terse, terse is really 9 o'clock in the morning. So they made a little bit of a, what, modification here to some extent. Um, all you Latin scholars, does tears mean anything to you? Uh, for you Schultzes, you should have some sort of idea because your son went to a school 
where they were seniors and one of you did too, didn't you? Go to a school, didn't you go to, I don't know if they called that up there though. Uh, when I went to school at, in Watertown, at PrEP in Watertown, okay, our classes were named Tertia, Corda, Quinta, and Zexta. Did they call it that up there? They did not, but I know that's up there. Okay, which seems a little bit odd. Ter tertia really comes from the Latin word for three. And you're, you're wondering why would the senior class in high school be called the third class? Because the Germans, uh, both in, in Europe and then as they came over here, brought over their schooling system, which was known as a gymnasium, all right? And as they were preparing for the ministry, they didn't have as many hours in, or as many classes in the college time as we do nowadays. They had two, they had two, and then they went on to the seminary. So tertia, which was a prep preparation for that time, and uh, sexta quinta corda tertia, that would be the high school training. You go two years of college, and then you went on to the seminary. And uh, my father used to say when he graduated from college, although this isn't really true, <laughs> He was in the class called Prima. You can guess what Prima means, okay? Prime or number one. So Tears stands for the third hour. Um, doesn't exactly fall in with the 24 hour of the clock, but if you're thinking of um, the dawn and then you're thinking of the beginning of work and then this is after you've gone several hours of work. That's what Tears' idea was, so in the middle of that. I cannot say that this is what they have in mind here, but they call it midday, which would be noon to us, right? Uh, so you're in the middle of your work is the idea here, all right? The third hour, and again, most of these, these the previous one, this one, and then the following one, are with the idea of as we are at work or we are about our tasks for the day, uh, we've already asked the Lord to guide us for the fresh new day that's coming. Oh, Lord, give me strength as I continue on. So a lot of the idea here is of, of uh, prayer, asking for the strength to continue onward. Our next one skips <laughs> a different hour. And you don't have that hour listed here. That would be called sext. And that comes from the word six, right? That's actually the noon hour. It's actually the noon hour, 12 o'clock noon. And again, you're in the middle of the workday. Well, you're right in the middle of the workday, supposedly. So the petitions and the prayers for the strength to continue on. Um, Lord, take care of those things that I've already done. Take care of what lies ahead yet. That was the idea for that service. The next service would be at 3 o'clock. You don't have that either. That was called none. None is the, comes from the Latin word for nine. So if you're counting from 6 o'clock, this is the ninth hour, right? Three, six, nine, all right? Um, this is a little bit more like the close of work, I suppose, although you're not quite done with it yet, all right? So you're asking the Lord for that final time of strength you need for the last hour or two of work to get through the day and that he would bless your efforts. Now, the interesting thing about this, I don't know if this is true, <laughs> but I have seen this. Where does our word afternoon come from? This none is in there, okay? So you're in the afternoon. It's not, we think of it as after 12 o'clock, right? They're thinking of this in, at the close of the afternoon, what we call afternoon, the close of the day from that time period. And that's actually where our English word afternoon came from, after the none, after that time of day where that service was uh, being held. Uh, your next one you have, Vespers. Generally, it was done around 6 o'clock. That's the close of the, the workday, you might say, before the time of rest, before you go to bed at night. And uh, the idea there was a little bit more reviewing God's uh, guidance, his providence for you, getting you through that day, closing off that day or the work part of that day with that idea of praise to God for the strength that he has given us and looking forward then to the evening time that would come. Um, the burdens and the care of the day in that sense are sort of over with. And that became a thought that came with the Vespers service. See, and you're familiar with Vespers to a, a certain extent. 
And then the last service of the day, this is the only <laughs> other one. You would, we would always have matins, we would have vespers. Complied would come in there at times. Um, not generally used, but it was still sort of hanging around yet. That would be at nine o'clock at night. And uh, I don't know what time you all go to bed, but that was the idea behind it. We are now closing off the day, giving thanks to the Lord for the day in which he has blessed us and helped us through. And now we're actually asking a little bit more for a very restful and peaceful night. Um, as the idea of tranquility there as the Lord closes out the day for us. Now, th th these were the, what were called the office, offices of the church as far as the worship was concerned, every three hours. It did begin in the congregations, um, towards the in Middle Ages and whatever, it was carried on more or codified a little bit more by the uh, monasteries, you know, where they were living in communities, Christians were living in communities. And what I think is interesting is they're putting this back in front of us once more. This was the way Christians worshiped from the uh, beginning, following Christ's resurrection, whatever. Now, granted, it's collected over time, but it's a useful way to go about your day. And my encouragement to you would be, when sometime you get a blue hymnal, uh, utilize these. Uh, whether you do that in a family setting, whether you do that in a private setting for yourself, uh, with some of these ideas, maybe you can remember uh, the reason behind this and use it as just a very simple form of worship as you go throughout your day, looking to your Lord for the strength and the blessings that he alone can give and then closing off the day with this, Lord, give me peaceful rest for the night. So those are the ideas of the different offices that are called uh, of worship that we have. These were intended, the ones I was just showing you, for the smaller setting. In our worship, uh, regular worship part of the hymnal, we have vespers, we are, excuse me, we have matins, we have vespers, and we have compline and a little bit of a longer version with the canticles and the, the uh, ancient hymns that are also utilized in that. So that is your instruction period today. Any questions? Any thoughts? Okay. This morning, we're going to use uh, the Office of Lauds, or Lauds, I should say. It's, you'll find that on page 238. And we'll ask you as the congregation uh, throughout this, a very short service, all right? So we'll have a shorter service today, uh, depending on how long I think I want to preach the sermon, I guess. <laughs> and uh, we'll have you speaking the parts that are going to be in the bold print, all right? And now we'll begin in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll begin singing our first hymn, though. That'll be hymn number 778. 778. And many of our hymns today will include the thoughts of the Good Shepherd as he is providing for us. 778.
And now, if we would please rise and join with me in the office of Louds, the dawn. And again, we'll have you speak the responses in the bold print. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. We just sang our opening hymn. Let's join together in the psalm for the day. Good Shepherd Sunday, we join in the reading of Psalm 23. You'll find that in the beginning part of the hymnal. Psalm 23. We'll begin with the reading of the refrain, read through the verses and the Gloria, and then end with the reading of the refrain once again. If you would join with me. I will live in the house of the Lord all the days, all the days of my life. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will live in the house of the Lord all the days, all the days of my life. The congregation may be seated. And now we look at a few of our lessons for today. You'll find them as an insert in your bulletin. Once again, the lessons are a little bit longer, so they're on an insert in your bulletin for this morning. And our gospel lesson in particular, along with the epistle, will highlight the aspect of the Good Shepherd in our lives. Our first lesson from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, to introduce where Paul is, and then 26 to 33. He is on his first missionary journey. He's in Pisidian Antioch, and uh, Antioch and Pisidia, excuse me. And he is giving a very short rendition of all that Christ has done to people who had never really heard all of this before. And he centers upon his death and his resurrection as bringing us once again back to our God. We read in Acts chapter 13. After the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Gentlemen, brothers, if you have a word of encouragement for the people, say it. Then Paul stood up, motioned with his hand, and said, Gentlemen, brothers, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, this message of salvation has been sent to you. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him, and by condemning him, they fulfilled the statements of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no grounds for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they carried out everything that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. These same individuals are now his witnesses to the people. We are preaching to you the good news about the promise that was made to our fathers. God has fulfilled this promise for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. That God would raise him from the dead, never again to subject to decay, God said in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. Therefore, he also says in another place, you will not let your Holy One see decay. 
For David, after he had served God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, was laid to rest with his fathers, and saw decay. But the one God raised did not see decay. So, gentlemen, brothers, let it be known to you that through this Jesus, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Also, forgiveness from everything from which you could not be justified through the law of Moses. In this Jesus, everyone who believes is justified. Here ends the reading of our first lesson this morning from the book of Acts. Our second lesson is the epistle lesson today from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. In last Sunday's text from, or epistle lesson from Revelation and Revelation 5, we got a little bit of a peek into heaven. You have that again happening here. But don't limit it only to heaven. There are ways that it also involves us here who look to Christ as our Savior in faith. We read in Revelation chapter 7, you may hear this quite frequently at a funeral service. After these things I looked... And there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing in front of the throne and of the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches in their hands. They called out with a loud voice and said, Salvation comes from our God, who sits on the throne, and from the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, the elders and the four living creatures, They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders spoke to me and said, These people dressed in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? And I answered him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, they are in front of the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. They will never be hungry or thirsty ever again. The sun will never beat upon them, nor will any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here ends the reading of the epistle lesson. And in response to our first two lessons, we join in the singing of our next hymn, 551, Jesus, Shepherd of the Sheep, 551.
Please rise for the reading of the gospel this morning. The gospel lesson for the day, Good Shepherd Sunday, is recorded in John chapter 10, beginning at verse 22. All of John chapter 10 is really about the Good Shepherd in different ways as he provides for us. He lays down his life for us. He gives us whatever we need, and he, here he assures us that he holds us in his hand. We read in John chapter 10. Then the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple area in Solomon's colonnade. So the Jews gathered around Jesus asking, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I am doing in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the word of our Lord from the Gospel. The congregation may be seated as we continue with our singing of our next hymn. Hymn number 555. 555. Also a song about the shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want.
Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we're going to look at the epistle lesson today as we're going through the book of Revelation here over these Sundays in the Easter season. I'll begin at uh, verse 14 once more. The el <clears throat> excuse me, the elder is talking to John, and he says, These are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, they are in front of the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. They will never be hungry or thirsty ever again. The sun will never beat upon them, nor will any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. In Christ Jesus, their fellow redeemed in our Lord. At the funeral services of Christians long ago, there was a custom that was carried out that I talk about at times when we have a funeral service taking place here. It's a very beautiful and meaningful custom that the believers had at that time. We're told that in days gone by, when a member of a congregation passed from this earthly existence, his name was not removed from the membership role. Instead, following his name, a notation was made, transferred to the church above. See, so sure were those early Christians of the oneness of the church. The church below, but the church in heaven. That death was merely a transfer. It was a changing over in a sense of moving of what, from one congregation to the next. Think of what a beautiful thought that really is. But it's more than just a thought. That is true. As true as any of the other truths that God gives us in his holy word. There is no reason for you and I not to be sure, just as sure of this glorious fact as those early Christians were. Our loved ones who have departed this life, trusting in Christ as their Savior, they are still members of Christ's church, of which he is the head. There is only one church, and we are still, in one sense, united in this mystic, sweet communion that binds us together, all those who belong to God through faith in the Savior. Paul writes, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. For this reason he died, rose, and lived again to be the Lord of both the dead and the living. As much as Christ is our living Savior, so he is still the living Lord of our departed ones who have gone from us in the faith. They are still members of his church, even as you are but they are members of the church triumphant, as one day you will be too, in faith, upon your departure from this present existence. This is partly what John meant when at the start of this section, he began by saying, after these things, he means the life of God's people in the church here below in this world. After these things, which he had talked about in the previous part of this chapter, I saw... And look, a great multitude. He's saying, look at the church above. Look how many there are. They were made up of a number that no one could count from every nation and tribe and language and people that were standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. So what's the biggest crowd that you've ever been a part of? Maybe a Cardinal baseball game, Kansas City football game, maybe a concert, maybe a political rally. Probably the largest crowd that I was ever a part of <laughs> took place quite a while ago, 1981. It was at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. There were over 100, 
3,000 people that were there. I could never have counted them, but there was someone who must have counted them. Well, the crowd that John sees here is so much larger, you can't even compare to any crowd that you or I might ever have been a part of. So big that no one could even begin to count them. It's as if John is just saying, look at that number. Look at how many there are. You can't count them all. Now, if you're thinking of Scripture, doesn't that remind you of what God promised the Old Testament patriarchs? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that their descendants would be as innumerable as the stars in the heavens or even as the sand upon the seashore? God was not just talking about physical descendants either when he said that. He was talking more along the lines of spiritual descendants, people who would be saved by faith in the coming Savior, just as those patriarchs were. God says, the promise is by faith so that it may be according to grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's descendants, to the one who has the faith of Abraham. It's the faith that makes one a child of Abraham. He is the father of us all who believe in Christ. Think of all the believers that lived in the past, throughout the Old Testament, and then the New Testament times. Then think of all the believers from that time that John saw this vision until now. And then add to that all the believers that are yet to be born in the years that lie ahead before Jesus returned. Look how many, John writes. You know, if John had recorded the names of the people that he saw, you would see names like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Malachi, all the Old Testament believers. And then you would read about John and his fellow apostles, Peter, Paul, Andrew, James, and the rest. And then you would read of all our faithful Christian friends and family and those whom we have never actually even met here in this world who are yet to come, all who cling to faith in Christ. You would read of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren yet unborn. You would read of black and white and red and yellow and people of every type of skin color and tone and every style of speech. So many that no one could count them all, and neither could you. Yet Jesus, the good shepherd, as was mentioned in the gospel lesson, knows each one by name. And he treats them all the same. He gives them the white robes of his righteousness that he won for us upon the cross. For they trust only in him for the salvation that he alone could provide. Look at the church above. Look how many are in it. And if you believe in Christ as a savior, your face is among them too. Now look where they stand. They stand united unharmed before God's throne. God's throne symbolizes his almighty power. It also symbolizes his gracious rule in the lives of his people in the kingdom. He is the almighty and the faithful God with whom nothing is impossible. He is the God of salvation. Everything is under his control. And for those who look to him, that throne marks his presence among them. That throne symbolizes the place where no harm shall ever come before his people. Nothing shall ever touch them to pull them away from him. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, after his resurrection, he declared that all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. The Father sitting on the throne bestows that. The Son wields that in the eternal interest of his people. And now look where those people stand, before the throne where he is in total control over all things. You know, sometimes while we're still here on earth, it doesn't seem like he's in control. Was Jesus in control when Russia for 
apparently no good reasons, invaded Ukraine? Is Jesus in control when sickness overcomes and strikes a person down? Is Jesus in control if ever a nuclear holocaust should strike? Often it seems to us like he's not in control. If he were, we say, why do such things happen? Why do hardships come to everyone? You can't always give a specific reason for that, for every hardship that might come our way in life. Too often the mystery of his will and his workings go far beyond. They escape us. But isn't it a little bit presumptuous on our part to judge the wisdom and the ways of the one who sits on the throne that is above? We do well to remember that all we are and all we have are God's doing. We could not exist for even one second of the day if his hand was not blessing. Besides, it's not he who caused this world to fall into the decay and disarray that it's in. It was we in our sin who caused it and the troubles that enter as a result of that. Such trials then and difficulties, they're inescapable here on earth because of it. Such trials and difficulties will always be there, but always keep in mind our need to rely upon him then as a result, and they become evidence of our need to rely upon him for body and soul and everything. He will use all things to keep our eyes trained upon him in the narrow way that leads to everlasting life. And without him, we would perish. But he's on the throne. He's making sure that these things won't harm us eternally. We are his sheep, of whom he says, nothing can pluck you from my hand, and nothing will pluck you from my Father's hand. <clears throat> so now look at the church that is above. Those who are there are a sure sign to us that that promise is kept. They made it through. And now look where they stand before God's throne. His presence is ever over them. His tabernacle surrounds them, or his tent is spread over them, because they are his forevermore. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. You know, what must it be like to never have any type of a setback once again in life? A setback, whether of body or of spirit. To feel like you never lose anything, but only blessing upon blessings, one after another, comes your way. That sounds great, but it's not how life works here. We must go through many hardships in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, Paul said. People get sick, people lose jobs, people lose their homes, they get cancer. And in the end, all die. Life doesn't work perfectly here on earth, does it? But it does in heaven. Think of the joy. Look at the joy that must be on the faces of this crowd that is dressed in white, standing before the throne. These are God's people. They experience nothing but victory. His victory that now lasts for them forever. That can be hard to wrap our own minds around because it's not our reality in the present. But it is there in the church that's above. But the biggest reason for their joy is simply this. The lamb at the center of the throne is their shepherd. He leads them to springs of living water and God wipes away every tear from their eyes. That's the one who was slaughtered for our sin. It's Christ Jesus. He's the cause of that joy. The lamb, yet also now the shepherd that he always is and always seeks to guide, protect, and to take us onward. Never again will they have to face any kind of loss or hurt because of sin. 
such is the existence of those who dwell in the church above. So why is this picture given to us? That we might find comfort knowing what has happened to our dear ones who have passed on? Yeah, but there's so much more than that. A cartoon appearing in a daily newspaper eh, quite a while ago showed a crowd of people that were walking along a busy city street in one of our large cities in our country. Each person had his head slanted downward and his eyes were looking only at the pavement. Beneath the picture, this caption read, almost no one looks up anymore. Think of how true that is when you consider the majority of people in our day and just in our own country. So concerned about all the chaos that is going about us in the world that is reality, or all concerned about the luxuries that they could receive for themselves in some way, most of them have lost the capacity to look up, to see where it all ends to those who cling to faith in Christ. Those who have gone before us, who have been transferred to the church triumphant, they already enjoy his tent that is spread over them. And someday, when the clocks of heaven strike the appropriate hour, when our own departure will take place, we shall worship with them where we will be with him forever before God's throne. But without that upward look, at the lamb that was slain, who is now our shepherd, it will not happen. So, look up to him in faith. Keep your eyes upon the sky for his return. Know with joy, the complete joy of his victory over sin and death, which those who have gone before already have. That's in the church above. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, but I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God grant that in our lives of faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may now be seated as we bring our offerings before our Lord. Please rise, and in taking out your hymnals, once again, turn to page 238 in the service of Lauds, the dawn service, 238. One of the ancient canticles that is sung is known as the Benedictus. The, a canticle is a song which you find in the scriptures, not just a regular hymn but one of the songs that is sung by one of the believers of old, whether that be Mary at the time uh, that Jesus was announced to be born, or in this case, this is Zechariah's song, as John the Baptist was about to be uh, born, and it, or really after he was born. It is a song that they sang to the glory of God that speaks of the blessings of what the Savior brings to us in life. 
We read this song. We'll join together in reading it this morning. Praise be to the Lord. Song of Zechariah. If you would join with me. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. And now, the prayer section of the loud service. I'll add a few other thoughts as we, before we go to the Lord's Prayer. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Keep us today, Lord, from all sin. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we have put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. Let us never be put to shame. And, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd who laid down your life for the sheep. Lead us now to the still waters of your life-giving word every day in our lives, that we might abide in your Father's house forevermore through our faith in you. And dear Lord, on this day in which we are grateful for the mothers that you have given us, we come before you in prayer for them. It has been you, Lord, who from our mother's arms have blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love. In our mother's endless hours of caring for us, watching over us, and praying for us, you were holding us in your arms. We give thanks to you for the mothers you have given us. Richly bless them according to their needs and make them strong to carry out their responsibilities. Just as you gather your children under the shelter of your wings, give mothers the same desire to protect and comfort those entrusted to their care. And for all other needs that we have, we come before our Lord in the prayer that he taught us to join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. The congregation may be seated as we join in the singing of our final hymn, 890, 890, Jerusalem the Golden.
Again, we welcome all of you to our service today and pray that you've been strengthened in your faith by God's word. Maybe you got a little bit of a picture of how worship has taken place within the church as we had that introduction to the different parts of the offices of worship as they were called. And um, perhaps you can utilize that in your own worship at home or so. Then we invite you to remain following our service for a time of fellowship and refreshments and then for a Bible study hour. And then mothers, may God grant you his blessings on the day that lies ahead. And kids, thank your moms for all that she's done for you, whatever that might be in your life.